Uh, so we need to loosen up a little bit. It's like early in the morning. Yeah. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm still pretty loose already. You are? Yeah, it's my best time of the day. Oh, it is. Okay, yeah. good. I, I didn't sleep well last night, so I'm still trying uh, to play. That may be true too, but I'm, to... I'm always uh, my best time. Okay. So thanks for joining us. I'm Matt Taylor from uh, Dementa. This is my. I'm Jeff Hawkins. He also is from Dementa. Yes. <laughs> friend and co-founder of Numenta, and uh, so we're here to talk about hierarchical temporal memory and especially an emphasis on an extended theory uh, onto hierarchical temporal memory that includes sensory motor integration. Um, so I think a good place to start with that, um, if, you if you don't know what uh, how HTM works or HTM theory, you can uh, watch these videos that uh, explain it from the ground up, uh, and then from there, you probably have a good uh, idea of what we're going to be talking about in this video. Um, so, just can I just before we start, I just uh, just to reemphasize, HTM is a is an evolving theory of the neocortex. That's what it is, and so at any point in time, it can be extended and it doesn't replace what's there. It's just we're adding more pieces to it. So uh, we've been going through that process in this last year, about just about a year ago, uh, we had a significant advance, which you're asking me to talk about. Yes. Um, and I'm going to do that. Uh, I should point out that we have, are in the process of preparing a manuscript on this for publication, but we haven't gotten that out yet. So we're giving you sort of a preview here. Sneak peek. Yeah, <laughs> sneak peek. So I might just ask you a black So, um, if you uh, if you know anything about the neocortex, uh, we're talking some neuroscience now. It, if you took a slice of the neocortex, you have it's about two and a half millimeters thick, and there are layers in there. Um, so the, the the exact number of layers varies depending on who you ask and how you're counting. So um, I, there's always some liberty in this, but I'm going to I'm going to talk about this as sort of always a sort of common layer four. And then there's, uh, then there's layer three. It, people often just say layer two, three. I'm going to actually divide that into um, lower layer three, three B, three A, and two. Um, and in the past, when we, we, if you're familiar with our work up to recently, uh, we we came up with a model for how one of these layers learns sequences. That's the atrium temple memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, when we, we've written papers about that, we're getting a lot of attention on it. Um, it's a real detailed biological model how real neurons do sequence memory. We actually never told people where that exactly exists in this diagram. We um, sort of fuzzily said two, three. Two, three. Well, I was not trying to, because when if you're not talking to a neuroscientist, you want to be more specific than that, it gets a little complicated. Mm. But for today, I'm going to actually place it someplace else. Okay. Uh, well, not someplace else, but more in detail. The, the model we've done so far, if you think about it, uh, the HTM sequence memory, I believe is actually going on in layer 3B. Um, and the reason for that is, and I'll take the green one here, uh, is that you have inputs coming from your sensors. So that could be from your eyes or your skin or your ears. And so we have that sensory input in the brain. It actually goes through something called the thalamus on the way to the, into the cortex, but that's not important. And these axons, this literal axon from a neuron goes up, and it makes it connections on these cells. These axons, I'll just draw one. But when we model temporal memory, we have the spatial cooler and the, and the, the temporal memory. That's all going on in these mini columns in one layer of cells. That's pretty much it. Right. And in these lower layer three cells actually get these connections directly from the, from the thalamus. And then they make a lot of horizontal connections within that layer, and that's where the memory of sequences comes from. So if you're distal, those are the distal connections. So the green is the sensory input goes on to the proximal synapses, and then uh, the horizontal connections are the distal ones. So when we model temporal memory, it's really just one layer of cells. The inputs coming out to the proximal distites, and all the cells connect to each other, and that produces sequence memory. Right. Um, so that's the model we've done before. And that's implemented right now in several places in, in our community and in Oh yeah, UK. a lot of people, we we came up with this one, I, I'm not sure if it's six or seven years ago yeah, well, when the first CLA white paper came we, out. But we opened source three and a half or so, yeah. almost four years ago. So, and we've kind of beaten the pulp out of this thing because we, we've characterized it, we've published it, we've, we've done all kinds of things where people have implemented it in hardware. So um, this is a well understood, at least conceptually and mathematically, uh, thing going on. now. What was this all about? If you think about um, the brain, and you think you, this is your, your cortex, we're just talking about one region here, but they're all doing the same thing. Um, you've got these inputs coming in from your senses, and they're changing, right? 
And one of the things we know is that the cortex makes a predictive model of the world. It learns the structure in the world, and in its predictive, it's always trying to predict what's going to happen next. I mean, that was the core thesis of our intelligence. Right. Um, and so this temporal memory is a predictive model of sequences. It says, okay, when the patterns change in some sort of predictable way, I can predict, I can, I'll model it, I'll learn the sequences, and I'll make predictions about it. Um, but the, there's another way that the inputs can change, and that's when you move your body. So in terms of that's the, mass, the vast majority of the changes that are coming into your brain is because you move. I'm moving my head constantly here. I'm moving my eyes three to five times a second. Um, I'm, I'm moving my fingers. I'm touching things. My body's shifting you around. You can say it's rare that you get sensory input that doesn't involve Yes, you. right. You could say, yes, it is rare. I could sit here and close my eyes and listen to you speak. That's sensory input that's not because of my own behavior. But hearing myself speak right now is because of my own behavior. Yeah. So um, that is the, the vast majority of the world is changing uh, on your senses because you move. And this turns out to be um, the primary way you learn about the structure of the world. You have to combine your movements with um, the change of the sensory input. And this is basically all the brain has to work on. Right. Uh, this concept was known uh, back in the 18, late 1800s. Helmholtz talked about it because he realized that when you, every time your eyes move, the input to your brain changes, and somehow you have to combine the, uh, and you're not aware of it most of the time. You're just not even aware your eyes are moving. Yet the input's going, and so why does the world seem stable right. when the inputs are changing? And the only way you can explain that is that the brain has to, comp has to somehow at least understand that what movements are being occurring, at the, what movements you're making, and using that as part of the inference process. It has to feed back into it. Yes. Uh, most people think, a lot of people think that, oh, okay, the brain is trying to remove the influence of movement. But that's not true at all. The brain is actually taking advantage of this uh, movement to learn how the world works. And what we've done last year is we figured out essentially the mechanism, the equivalent mechanism for temporal memory, but the mechanism by how the, the brain um, uses movement to make a predictive model of the world. So it's just a direct extension of, of this, um, except uh, it's, uh, it's basically, it's not just temporal memory, it's spatial, uh, I mean, it's sensory motor memory. It's, it's connected differently. Yeah, right? well, what we turned out is we, we, we had tried to do this a few years ago, actually, um, and we didn't, we had some problems. The big insight we had last year is that if you took the exact same model that we have for temporal memory, uh, same columns, spatial pooler, and all this stuff, and um, instead of just allowing the, connect, the cells to connect uh, via the distal dendrites between themselves, within, if, that, there within that region, yeah. if you added another uh, um, external signal, which would be what we call um, an allocentric location, I'll explain what that is in a moment, that um, now the system, the exact same code, will do. Um, uh, uh, do sensory motor inference. It'll model the structure of 3D objects in the world uh, and put a, put a predictive model on it. So that's a big insight. When um, you asked me to talk about something, which I wouldn't normally do, if, if I normally would talk about the new theory, I would just talk about the new theory, the sensory motor theory. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go into that. Um, but, but if we want to be really precise, what's going on here is that, I'm going to draw a little picture here. Here's layer four. Layer 4 is, of course, very well known as the input layer to the cortex. And so these same axons, the green guys that, that I said a moment ago make connections up here, actually make connections in these cells here too. And so what we believe is going on, this is a hypothesis, we believe what's going on is that um, layer 4 and lower layer 3 are basically both doing spatial pooling, they're both doing the same mini columns, mm -hmm. but the layer 4 cells are actually learning the sensory motor inference and the layer 3 B cells are learning the high order of sequence memory. Within Those, the same layer. In this, well, th th within these two layers. Yeah, just two of this. Yeah, this they're, they're, they're really kind of back to back. If you think about them, they're, they're, all get, they're getting the same input. Right. Uh, why do we say they're two different layers? Because the layer four has a different set of connectivity. Layer four has this other signal which is coming in, which layer three does not. Right. So, so there's, layer three is getting its context from itself. Yes. But layer four is getting yes. its distal yes. context from itself. And I want to be else. careful, I'm talking about lower layer three, the part that's getting the sensory input. Okay. The upper three. layer three does not get that sensory input. So, the, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate they call them layer three because it's really two different layers and they, they use that in that terminology. Um, anyway, so the, the basic idea is that we can take the exact same code we had from temporal memory put a new signal into it and run it the same way as before and you'll get a sensory motor inference. We'll talk about how that works. Um, in reality, I think what's going on in the cortex is these things are occurring together sort of right on top of one another, sort of the part of the same basic, they're basically the same spatial pooler and these are the same mini columns. And, um, and so when a, when a slice of cortex is getting an input from the sensory organs and that input's changing, 
it tries to model it both ways. It says, I don't know how why it's changing. It could be changing because you're moving. It could be changing because the world is moving, or it could be changing a combination of the two. I got all I need to do here to figure out which of those or which combination of those is going to work. So they have to operate cooperatively in some way. It's, in some way, it's pretty simple. It's really, really simple. It's really just one thing. Uh, it's, it, the, I didn't draw it very well here, but these mini columns are really the same mini columns, the same spatial puller. Mm -hmm. And it's some of the cells have an extra input and some of them uh -huh. don't. That's it. So it's, a, it's the same structure, but two sort of different algorithmic processes. Uh, it's over. really just one has a different input. It's the same algorithm, actually, but yeah. you'll see in a minute. Um, so I, I, but we don't want, I don't want to focus on that. That's, that's a little bit more speculative than what we've been working on. What we have been working on is essentially modeling layer four and the upper layer uh, three and two. Um, and uh, and that's, those two are required to understand sensory motor inference. Okay. Um, so uh, this is sort of in the context of what we've done recently. If you're an HTM follower or a NumPic follower, um, you, you, you know, what we're going to talk about here is not a new theory. It's not a replacement for what we've done. It's actually a direct extension of what we've done. But in the papers we're writing now, we're, we're actually not going to talk about the temple memory part of it. We're just talking about the sensory motor inference part of it. Right. So what, we're, what we are, what we are we're currently in the process of writing, the research, writing papers, um, we're talking about essentially um, a layer four and another layer up here, what we'll call layer, um, we'll say layer, upper layer you know, two and layer three A if you want. But, um, yeah, let me get rid of that there. And uh, two layers where, um, you know, the input comes into this layer. We have this other signal, which we're going to talk about. This layer projects to this layer. This layer projects back. This layer projects this way and this way. And um, so we have this two layer model now that does sensory motor inference. And this is, aside from 3B over here, temporal memory, this is a, a completely separate right now. Well, it's separate in our code base right now. Right, but it's the same algorithm. It's the same algorithm. It's actually the same code. Same we didn't, code, we didn't right, rewrite right. any of the code. It's yeah. the same neuron model exactly. We're not changing any of that. Yeah, that's kind of important because we're building on the fundamental stuff we've already done. Yeah, I mean, literally, we did not write any new code. Or right. We just we basically just put another signal into the into the existing temporal memory code. We did have to create this pooling layer up here, which, uh, so we created a second layer, um, but again, using HTM neurons. Um, and we've had to build a model of a two layer circuit to do this. Right. Um, but it's a very, very powerful system when we do that. And um, <clears throat> so comparing and contrasting you know, temporal memory, which is sequence memory versus this uh, sensory motor inference layer. First of all, the big difference is distal context in sequence memory comes from the sequence. It basically comes from the other cells other in the layer. cells that are kind of identifying. In the layer. They're, they're just, they're in the layer. The, the pattern in the layer leads to another pattern in the layer, yeah. leads to another pattern in the layer. Uh, versus this, where we get the distal context from elsewhere. Yes. And that is some type of motor. Yeah, well, well, I'll just tell you what it is. So uh, the term is, um, this is a term that's used a lot in neuroscience, but not anywhere else and other places. It's called an allocentric um, representation, and we call it allocentric representation of location. Allocentric just means, um, it's, uh, it means other. Uh, it's the opposite of egocentric. So egocentric means something relative to your body, Allocentric means something relative to something else, some other thing. So like in a coordinate system, egocentric would be in relation to my center somewhere. Yes, an object. yeah. So here's this, we, we use coffee cups a lot, so we're going to do that in this, this talk here. Uh, here's my uh, reusable coffee cup, and I can, I can have a location of this coffee cup relative to my body. That would be the egocentric location. Right. Um, if I wanted to know where this hole is relative to the rest of the lid, or where this part is relative to the bottom, or uh, any feature here relative... So the coffee cup, that would be in the reference frame of the coffee cup. Right. So allocentric. That would be an allocentric location. Right. The key, and by the way, allocentric locations are known to exist in many parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like um, a known idea. Um, some people got uh, recently got the Nobel Prize for discovering these uh, grid and place cells in the hippocampus and right. the entorhinal cortex. When you think about an object and just think about it, that's yeah. you're thinking about about it allocentrically. You're generally not thinking about in, in rel relation to me. You're just thinking yes. about the object. Well, it's a, clearly if I have a model of a coffee cup, and it's, and I do, I, I have this model of the coffee because every time I touch it, my brain is predicting what it's going to feel. I right. I use this cup every day. I understand it very well. That model 
has to be in an allocentric framework. It right. cannot be in an egocentric framework because it, it moves every time. So knowing where the feature is relative to my nose doesn't do me any good because over here it's different than over here and there. So in hindsight, it's clear that we must under, we must model the world in allocentric coordinates. In the in the parts of the brain where they've studied this the most, it's usually related to some room. Like a rat will walk through a room, and the rat knows where it is in the room. Uh, it's relative to the room. These are called the place cells. So the kidneys say, oh, I know, I'm in this corner of the room. And you, you're doing that here too. We and I know where we are relative to this room in the kitchen and my office. I usually do. Yeah, I usually do. Drink your coffee. <laughs> um, so um, the key insight we had here was that allocentric location, this is a, you can just imagine an SDR that represents a location on some physical, something out there, um, is uh, used pervasively throughout the neocortex. It's everywhere. Uh, it's not just in some places of the brain, and it's a key ingredient coming into even primary sensory regions. So what this means is when I, if I touch this cup, my finger is feeling some sensation. That sensation is going to some part of my, my somatosensory cortex. Right. But it's not just getting the sensation, it's so also... Like proximal input from Proximal input senses. saying, oh, I'm feeling an edge or a curve or something like that. But to associate it with an object. Yes. So the, the second, the context in which it occurs, is the location on the object itself. Right. So as I, I, the representation I'll get in my layer four here is a representation of a feature at a location on the object itself. So for example, if you've got a, a black box and you reach your hand in and you start touching something you don't know what it is, you're getting sensory input proximally into the layer, but once you're, you're also building a model of some well, allocentric object. Yes, at first you may not know where you are on the object, so that's a challenge we have to yeah. be addressing. But once you know where you are on the object, then you essentially, to learn what a coffee cup is or a pen or anything else, it's literally, it's, it, it is literally saying this feature at this location, this feature at this location, this feature at this location. Now that sounds pretty basic, but that's what it is. But, then, but once you're getting that information, you're also kind of doing a comparison to everything you've already known about every object that you've already Yes, touched. well that's good. So that's the inference part, right? That's right. like, so um, I'll make a, a subtle con uh, connection here. If you think about that, for those who really understand the temporal memory very well, um, the state of the cells at any point in time, when you're in a sequence, this is a very high order state, mm -hmm. uh, very sparse, that state represents uh, both the sequence and where you are in the sequence. Absolutely. I'm at the third yeah. note of Beethoven's fifth or yeah. something like that, right? Yeah. The con what we're going to represent in layer four is, uh, is basically the feature, like the note, at a location. In this case, the location isn't a serial order. The location is some location on this object. This is the amazing thing, I think, about this, is that the same algorithm that we're using to, uh, to store sequences over time can be used to store object representation yeah. and point you know, yeah. it does both. around that object. It does. Well, it learns both. It learns the, the temporal structure of the world, and it learns the spatial structure of the world. And the way you learn the spatial structure of the world is via movement. Right. So, uh, so now we have a model. We, 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 what we can do in this is we learn a model of how the world looks or feels, what its structure is in reality, independent of what where it is relative to my body. Right. So we build a predictive model of a coffee cup, a predictive model of a camera, or whatever. All this stuff is stored in your head. So you know, in the cortex, you have to do that. So that was the the big insight was that allocentric locations are available even in primary sensory cortex. Mm -hmm. um, we now know now that we know what to look for. We see all kinds of evidence for this that people had missed. Um, uh, I'm very, very confident in the basic idea. Uh, and we have worked this out in a fairly uh, detail as to how these layers work, uh, what they're doing to each other, and so on. So what do we know about where this comes from? Okay. What um, it represents? In yeah. You know, maybe um, uh, we should look, we'll look at some slides here. Sure. Okay. So um, we're going to do that on my laptop, and you guys will see that. Great. Uh, um, so uh, let's see, which one do I want to go to first here? Um, 